Now, most, of, uh, most of the conversation thus far has been really around uh, water quantity and management, but another key piece of that is water quality. And one of our challenging issues here in California, as elsewhere, is nitrogen. Uh, not the only issue, but one of them. And to uh, explore that a little bit with us is Perry Klassen. Well, thank you, Glenda. Good morning, and it's good to be here today. And uh, I follow Gordon in saying that that's a tough act to follow. First, we have the lead of the University of California, Department of Food and Agriculture, who's going to lead us to global peace, <laughs> and then the undersecretary. Now you have a nectarine and peach farmer from Parlier. <clears throat> Are you ready for this? Okay, I'm going to start my presentation by asking the question that's in my title, Nitrogen Fertilizer, Fertilization in Central Valley Crops, Are We Doing It Right? So the answer, of course, it depends on who do you ask this question of. You ask a farmer who's growing canning tomatoes and getting 65 tons an acre of high-quality fruit to the cannery for tomato, paste, pasta, and other things, and his answer is going to be, of course I'm doing it right. My production tells the story. 30 years ago, I was getting 30 tons of tomatoes. That truck holds 40 tons. So every acre, these farmers are producing 65 tons of canning tomatoes very regularly. This is not anomalies. And he's going to surely say my production has a lot to do with the nitrogen fertilizer pr program that, that I use to create this crop. Then I'm going to talk, then we'll you ask an almond grower who's, who's getting 5,000 pounds of almond nut meats per acre, tremendous amount of production. He had 2,500 ton, 2, pounds of almond nut meats a little less than 20 years ago. You ask that grower, am I doing it right? And of course he's going to say fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer played a huge role in this production increase. And in both of these instances, you can say there's no doubt dramatic improvement in irrigation technology, pest management, the high technology irrigation scheduling programs we have. There's a lot of things. It's not just nitrogen fertilizer, but you are not going to grow 65 tons of, of um, tomatoes, 5,000 pounds of nut meats on 50 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer. However, if you ask the regional water board, are we doing it right? The, question, the answer will probably, no, of course not, you're not doing it right. This is a map of the Central Valley. you got Redding on the top, Bakersfield on the top. For those of you out of aren't familiar with our valley, that's about a seven and a half to eight hour drive across that, that stretch of landscape. Seven million acres of irrigated cropland. So the Central Valley Water Board would say, of course not, you're not doing it right. Look at how many regions in the Central Valley where irrigated cropland is contributing to nitrates in groundwater. No farmers, you're doing it wrong. So who's right? So there's no argument, though, that in this 7 million acres, there's tens of thousands of tons of nitrogen fertilizer applied to the cropland. Total, every year, we're putting on tons, millions of tons. We're put using manures. We're switching to compost more and more. But those poundage alone are just a tremendous amount that we're adding. And then, yes, you go to these areas where you see those darker colors, and you're likely going to find, if you do the highest tech analysis of that water, you're probably going to find that nitrates from commercial agriculture are causing some of those problems. But we farmers and others in the water board will admit, too, there's, there's going to be water treatment plant effluent that's contributing to that. There's also going to be tens of thousands of septic systems of rural residents that are scattered across this region. So the, the count is, is, is easily over 20,000 small residences that have rural septic systems, which of quality, who knows. And then there's legacy nitrates. I'm a farmer, grew up in Parley or Reedley area. My dad farmed there. My grandpa farmed down the road from there. What were they doing 30, 50 years ago with their nitrogen fertilizer applications? Fertilizer was dirt cheap in those days. So what's the, so there's, seemingly there's a lot of blame to go around uh, for this nitrates in groundwater. So, so how do we best answer this question? Are we doing it right? Well, we're about to find out. In 2012, the Central Valley Regional Board ordered irrigated agriculture, represented by 13 coalitions, one of which I manage, to prove that their nitrogen fertilizing practices are protective of groundwater. 
Uh, we started field studies already this year in response to this mandate, and these, things are, these studies are going to continue for at least six years, no doubt much longer than that, and they will be funded largely by growers, assessments of growers. Some, of, some folks in agriculture, myself, are looking forward at the end of this to handing data to the regional water board that says, see, we're doing it right. Of course, I'm the optimistic. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. But there's a lot of guys in agriculture and ladies too that say, mm, I don't know. That data we're going to turn in may not show that we're doing the right things. Um, and even though the water board doesn't like to, to hear this, 100% nitrogen use efficiency is just about impossible to accomplish. Those of you who have done the studies have seen that. And even in the, the most um, widely planted crop in the Central Valley, almonds, uh, the studies have shown in the last five years that we're the best growers are doing well to get 80% nitrogen use efficiency. That's a little bit scary. And um, you know, commu computer models uh, might show that we can make gr great improvements in that. Um, there's simply, as a grower, a risk taking, there's a huge risk in us under applying nitrogen fertilizer stone fruit, almonds, anything. When you get about, when I was about ready to pick last week and my size was down, I couldn't put fertilizer on, nitrogen on, to try to bump up my size. There's just no way. I had to be applying my fertilizer in March and April to get the crop that I needed to harvest last week. So growers tend to err on the side of, of caution when it comes to fertilizing with nitrogen. It is a risk we can manage since the biggest risk to us, to farmers, the weather and markets, we have no control over. So the trick is getting as close to the sweet spot as we can. So what does it mean when farmers are doing it right? So I'll make it, um, get behind on my slides here. So what does it mean when we say we're doing it right? So as a nectarine farmer, peach farmer, it means I apply the right amount of fertilizer, the right amount rate that I need at the right time, not in the winter time when it's about to rain, and the right place where the roots can take it up, efficiently, and then the right nitrogen product. Nitrogen is not just nitrogen. There's a lot of formulations and such you can use. So if, if I follow each of these four R's and I use good irrigation practices, it can bring me and any other grower as close as you can to be as getting it done right as possible. So for those of you who have not heard the term, the four R's are the right, right rate, right time, right place, and the right product. This is uh, four R's are pretty widely known in the Midwest. Corn and soybeans have been working on this for a number of years, but this is now just beginning to make some pretty good inroads into California. And in my observation in agriculture for a lifetime and a career is that the almond and canning tomato industry is probably as close as, as, as we could be to having it, doing it right at this point. And uh, the, the growers that are following them are getting these kind of impressive yields that, that I was talking about earlier. And as, as important as, as this is, what growers are learning, and here's some data from the Almond Board and the University of California, is that growers are learning to match that nitrogen application to the crop uptake. Feed the plant when it's hungry. You're going to use that nitrogen more efficiently. The crop's going to put it to the best use and, and get the yields, the marketable yields, and the, the profit that we need so we can go back and farm again next year. Before we started doing some of these um, some of these field studies, we started looking at the scientific literature that's out there, and one of the questions that we need answered for more and more crops is how much nitrogen does it take to produce a pound of, um, in this instance, uh, nut meats? We need to understand that so we know when we decide and determine our nitrogen applications that we are, we are putting the amount on of that crop that it needs to get the maximum amount of production without having leakage past the groundwater. So with, the, with the, uh, the fertilizer practices that have been developed with the, the almond board, 65 pounds an acre is what's coming forward, is, is what's needed to grow 1,000 pounds of almond nut meats. That's what you, you eat and buy in the store. But what they also found is it's not 68 pounds, it's anywhere between 62 and 73. Of course, there's so many conditions that you have out there when you're growing, so it's a range. Now, I just want to mention, though, it cost about a million dollars to come up with this answer. Probably even more. I'm just estimating what it is, but there was a lot of money spent to get this number close to it is. The other harder question, it was somewhat looked at in these studies, is then if you put 65 pounds of nitrogen on, how much is going into groundwater? 
So that's the question, of course, on this conference in the next few days is to, to determine how do we measure that, how do we look at that. But, of course, as we're finding, the answer not only depends on the four R's, but soil types. Soil types have a tremendous impact. Rainfall, irrigation management, extremely important. And then it comes on, there's a lot to do with this Vados zone. When I learned that term here a few years back, it sounds like the twilight zone. You know, what's going on in the Vados zone? Well, it's just about as mysterious as the twilight zone because we, you can't stand here like a creek. I can look and watch at that water going by, high sediment loads, pretty easy to tell. But the Vados zone is invisible. In fact, you geologists, I have to give you credit, you have the best imaginations of any scientist. <laughs> to be able to picture what's going on in this very complex part of the earth. It's an important, it's a very important to understand that. So do the same four R's that I developed for nectarines, does that work when I have an impermeable layer, I've got hard pan on my ranch, or when I have sand streaks, or what I have, you know, what's going on down 50 feet, 10, 100 feet, 10 feet below the root zone? So the one thing, though, that we have developed that I think is most important is are the practices protective of groundwater? When we match that crop consumption curve, are we being protective of groundwater, um, groundwater quality? So, the, so the, the question that, that the regional board is asking us, are your practices protective of groundwater, will be answered in a program called the Management Practices Effectiveness Program. MPEP is the new term that we're using in agriculture right now in the Central Valley. Work water quality coalitions are combining efforts to support the PET program, which will consist of field studies and computer modeling that will produce, I think, incredibly valuable information about nitrogen management practices and their impact on water quality. So we're going to study this nitrogen movement through the root zone using suction lysimeters. Some of you geologists say, wow, that's 30-year-old technology. Well, there's not a whole lot of new things going on besides suction lysimeters. And then soil coring of different depths to see what's going on down in that beta stone to try to understand better what's, what might be moving past the root zone. So, and then these, this testing, this MPEP, MPEP testing that we're going to be doing, we're going to be performing on multiple crops where, where growers use the best practices, things that they know, at least from an economic standpoint, are giving them the yields that they need. So we're going to evaluate the best. And if, they, if the practices are shown effective, we go out to growers and say, you're good to go. What you're doing now with these best practices is, is protective of groundwater. However, if they're not effective, then it's back to the field to refine the practices even further. We've got to solve this problem. And I can't understate the enormity of this undertaking. What I just described in the last two minutes is something that's going to be take all the best minds in this room and production agriculture to figure out what is going on, how do we improve our practices for all the reason that Karen described, food security, world peace now. <laughs> so I, it's important for us to understand that. So when I, uh, the other, it, uh, and at stake of this is our credibility with the water board, um, with the public, and es especially our ability to continue farming and being in compliance with the California Water Code. So another huge challenge, though, is going forward is for, for the water quality coalitions, again, 13 of them in the Central Valley that I, that I manage one of, is how do we reach our farmers with education on, on the new practices that we may have to have. My coalition, as you see here, we've got about 3,500 farmers, 690,000 acres spread across a five-county area. That's just one of 13 coalitions. There's 7 million irrigated acres in the Central Valley. But it, our audiences reign. My, I'll talk about mine alone. I've, of, of my 3,500 members, we, we've got guys that are using iPhones, satellite technology, all the way to growers that have their records on the on the dashboard of their pickup still. And that's not to criticize them. These are good farmers, salt of the earth sort of individuals. But then we come down to how are we going to communicate with these folks? 53 percent of my members have emails. At least they have email addresses they're going to give us. What are the other 47% using? The, many of them are not using emails. They don't even have the ability to communicate in this way. So you, we all think, well, let's put it on a website. Let's send them emails. Well, that's, that's about half of my members. But the other thing is, so you reach them. That's one thing. But then how do you convince somebody that's been farming in the way he's farmed to change his practices? We're going to need this data. We're going to need solid information. I was talking yesterday in this panel. We love what you're doing in the Netherlands and Denmark and Israel and such, but we growers are over here are show-me individuals. You show me how it works in parlier on my nectarines. 
That's going to be the first step to convince you. I don't think it's any different in the Netherlands and Denmark and Israel. You want studies done over there to, to provide the basis for making these changes. <clears throat> and we're going to be doing that, that education and outreach in conjunction with the commodity groups, very valuable in the Central Valley, as well as the University of California. Uh, all the, all the farm advisors, the university research and such have done a great job in helping get us started on this. So the good news is that crops like almonds, corn, grapes, and walnuts make up about 80% of the irrigated acreage in the Central Valley. So improving nitrogen efficiency on just those five crops alone, that's a tremendous potential improvement in groundwater impacts if we can work on those. So here comes the hard question. Can we get a 10% improvement in that nitrogen use efficiency? I, I certainly hope so. But then here's the other one for you out to, to help us figure out. So then how do, you, how do you track improvements? So do you measure groundwater nitrate levels? Yeah, that can take years to show changes. So do you measure tons of fertilizer sold? Well, if it decreases, does that mean there's less nitrate movement into groundwater? So in the, if you measure nitrates in groundwater aquifers, where do you measure it? And where do you put these wells, or what wells do you use? What depth in the aquifer? Where is that well screened? Is it a shallow well or is it a deep shell? I mean, it's all those kind of questions that you all understand. And then how often? Do we go out once a year, every six months, every five years? So how do we measure progress? That's, that's a difficult question that we really hope from this meeting you get to give us some really good import, input on this. The Water Board would like to see us use shallow domestic wells surrounded by crops. So those wells have an extremely limited draw area. So yes, they will give us a good snapshot. It's the middle of my little 20 acres. What, is it, what does it look like there? But five miles away, there's, is there any influence on that well? Is it giving me trends that we need and the regulators need for, for determining progress? So the other one is how to, do we track the practices that growers are using that are shown to be protective? So th these are all courses, these are all subjects that you're going to be talking about over these next couple days in what I think is a very excellent groundwater session that you're probably on, Mr. Harder. I really appreciate that. And again, I do appreciate the chance to be here today. Um, I wish you all the best in your endeavors and your studies and your work that will come together and lots of good information. Thomas is going to be helping us uh, share with our coalitions. And I hope it can help me as a grower answer the question by saying, yes, I'm doing it right. Thank you for your time.